I am continuing in lecture 24 studies with neutron reflectometry technique. Uh, in the last lecture I discussed with you how we could interpret the alloy comp composition in a nickel aluminium multilayer. Though we use PNR but there it was more of physical density. Before I go on to polarized neutron reflectometry studies which is the most uh, interesting thing for the condensed matter researchers, I must briefly mention you ref neutron reflectometry for liquid-liquid interfaces. This is a branch of studies which has gained popularity in last I should say 20 years or so where we study the interface between two liquids or interface between liquid and air with various chemicals like we can study interfaces of a liquid possibly with surfactants sticking out from them. I use this example because we have studied myself formed from surfactants in sans technique. So similar studies in reflectometry for these interfaces are very much popular presently and such studies have become so much in demand that there are dedicated neutron reflectometers, often unpolarized neutron reflectometer where you can have physical density profiles for proteins on liquids or polymers on some kind of interfaces. I will use only one example to highlight the role of these studies. This study I have chosen it is with liquid-liquid interface with neutrons. Uh, such interfaces can also be studied with x-rays and have been done also. But in case of neutrons the interesting thing is that I discussed with you earlier that we can play with the D2O-H2 ratio in the solution or if it is water then in the water background or the water, water substrate on which we make spray these uh, chemicals uh, so that I can get a very good contrast that is the advantage. So here I am just showing you one example of nuclear reflectivity data for weak polycation PDMA EMA polydimethyl uh, methyl I amine mean methacrylate that is uh, one uh, polymer and spreading of such polymers are important in for biological samples because uh, and poly polyethylene oxide brushes and how they interpenetrate this is important these studies are important because uh, protein uh, spread or protein unfolding on such medium are of interest for biological studies. So here this example deals only with uh, an example of PDMA EMA uh, and PEO brushes and this study highlights how these brushes they interpenetrate. Actually they have been stabilized with a hydrating solution at pH 5 pH 5 and pH 10. So depending on the pH value we know that pH is the negative logarithm of hydrogen density and pH 7 is a neutral uh, solution. So pH 10 is uh, alkaline and pH 5 will be acidic. That's the thing and uh, we have just showing two data unre unpolarized reflectometry but uh, if you look at this schematic or the cartoon on the right hand side you can see that there are two possible configurations at the interface for PDMA, EMA and PEO. One is that they don't interpenetrate, they don't mix and the other one if they mix that the brushes interpenetrate. The first data at pH 5, you can, you can see that the fit without penetration, this one and with penetration have been attempted and the fit 
with penetration, interpenetration of the brushes gives a better fit and that means at pH 5 for these two brushes sprayed on a, on a hydrating solution allows interpenetration. But when we go to pH 10, of course under a pressure of 6 bar, this whole experiment was done at the pressure of 6 bar, then it switches from interpenetration to no penetration. Here the experimental data for interpenetration, this one and no interpenetration, compact fit. So this one gives a much better fit. So it supports this picture and this is not correct here. This is not accepted. Right. So this is an example where by measuring scattering length density profile, this is what we measure in all neutron and X-ray reflectometry experiments as I showed you earlier. This scattering density profile is a nuclear density if it is an unpolarized beam and for so it, we call it NSLD and in case of X-ray it is electron scattering length density or ESLD and if the system is magnetized or it has got magnetic moment then this NSLD for neutrons we also add one magnetic scattering length density I will get into it right now. So this is the only example I am using where uh, organic and biological samples at the interfaces and their properties with respect to their spreading into each other penetration into one of one medium to another medium can be studied using uh, neutron reflectometry or rather neutron reflectivity. Now I will get into polarized neutron reflectometry or beams with polarized. So polarized neutron reflectometry PNR is polarized neutron reflectometry. So as the name suggests that this PNR needs a beam which is polarized. <clears throat> now this can be done in two modes. One with no polarization analysis and with polarization analysis. So I will first talk about without polarization analysis and then with polarization analysis. Let me just show you the experimental setups. This is the one at Dhruva. This setup is at NCNR NIST. You can see that there is a polarizer in both the cases. There is a polarizer in both the instruments and after the instrument there is place for analyzer. Here also there is an iron silicon analyzer. So for without polarization analysis we have what we measure is R plus and R minus. So if this is the sample with this is the magnetization direction then I have two reflectivities one the neutron parallel to the magnetization in the sample and the other one is anti parallel to the magnetization in the sample and they are R plus and R minus. Now if you remember I had earlier also discussed this that this nuclear potential for R plus it is getting aided by one V magnetic and for R minus this is minus V magnetic. So now we have twice pi h square by m the potential the step potential rho b coherent this is the density b coherent plus minus a magnetic scattering length which gives me vm and this is either plus or minus and then because of that we have also the critical angles which are different because V dictates the critical angle of reflection for that particular neutron. So 
if i see the reflectivity i'll share with you if this is plus then this will be minus the critical angles are different and this polar let me just remind you that these polarizers are often super mirrors super mirrors these are as i showed you like in nist it is a iron silicon super mirror and as i explained to you earlier super mirrors reflectivity one is it has got a large critical angle over simplified picture but it is somewhat like this for one spin of neutrons and much smaller critical angle for another spin of neutrons and this is uh, if i take a reflection at an angle which is between these two critical angles then i can get a fully polarized beam so this is the principle of polarization and in the reflected beam say with using the same principle if i put an analyzer analyzer of the same super mirror at an angle which is again between these two critical angles then i will get only one particular spin reflected into the beam <coughs> and the other will be transmitted so i can find out what is if it is the plus one plus reflectivity then r plus is given by r plus 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 r plus minus both because we don't analyze when there is no polarization analysis but if we want to do the analysis then i will get two reflections it's non spin flip because plus goes as plus and spin flip plus goes as minus i'll come to it later <coughs> so this is the general assembly of a reflectometer with the analyzer in place in both these things typically in the reflected beam we need to put a polarization analyzer to know the non spin flip and spin flip so now first we are just measuring r plus and r minus that means we don't do any spin analysis of the reflected beam we just impinge a beam which is either parallel <coughs> to the uh, magnetization in the sample or anti parallel r minus and we measure them now as i told you earlier that that v in a matrix form has got two components one is the plus component one is the minus component so v plus and v minus equal to b coherent plus bn and v coherent minus b <coughs> and similarly <coughs> as i wrote earlier also earlier the critical angle was lambda square root of rho b coherent by pi for unpolarized beam now for the polarized beam i have got two critical angle which are described right now this is the expression for them so now we also have to consider the schrodinger equation for propagation of these waves and there are actually two equations one for the up neutron which is due to is a standard form of the schrodinger equation where v plus is the potential which is mentioned here and other one is for the anti parallel neutron which is given by e minus v minus say so you can see the solutions are different and the critical angles will be different for the solution so again now also i use parrot's formalism as i wrote earlier parrot's formalism to calculate the model reflectivity pattern for up and down neutrons and then fit do the fitting in our case we use genetic algorithm but there are other fitting techniques which are used and <clears throat> we get the solution in form of reflectivity as a function of angle for the two 
polarizations. So it's just an experimental example I'm showing you. It's a nickel film. This nickel film uh, is magnetic and uh, we know that nickel has a magnetic moment of around 0.54 Bohr magneton per atom. <coughs> so <coughs> I have shown here the plot of the reflectivity profile of the two spins R plus and R minus reflected from the film and we often we also take recourse to a plot of asymmetry parameter. Asymmetry parameter is this it is R plus Q minus R minus Q divided by R plus Q plus R minus Q. So this asymmetry parameter joins the two reflectivity profiles at one and also joins the fit to both of them as I show here. So we have fitted it using Parrot's formalism for the two spin components and this is the joint fit which shows the oscillation. These oscillations are due to Kiesig oscillation. I mean these are Kiesig oscillations and you can see the asymmetry parameters and the fit and from the fit we could get the magnetic moment density in this medium. So when we don't do polarization analysis what we get is magnetic moment density in the medium that is what we get. So this at the at a mesoscopic length scale. So now with this much of introduction to experiments that are possible without polarization analysis of the reflected beam. I use two examples to highlight the findings of such. One is that <coughs> this is a cobalt film which was deposited by electron beam de technique, electron beam deposition technique and this is a cobalt. Now interestingly uh, this is first before I take you to the neutron reflectometry or polarized neutron reflectometry usually for most of the samples we first carry out an XRR because XRR 1 it is possible to get very accurate result for the physical density because it's a high intensity technique. We have also used XTEM or cross-sectional TEM high resolution TEM to get the crystallographic structure at the interfaces. So never a study is complete or interesting enough unless we marry several techniques together. Surely PNR is an excellent tool but I want to highlight this point that to get interesting result we need to combine several techniques together. Here from the XRR data we calculate and you can see the Kiesig oscillations. So these Kiesig oscillations are coming because of the thickness of the film. Thickness of the film. As I am harping again and again and fit to the data gives me the physical density profile and gives us a signature of something which needs to be probed further. What are those signatures? One, if you look at the density profile that I have fitted for the cobalt film, what I would expect for a film, such a single film, film is somewhat like this. If I consider the substrate density profile is this in some unit, the cobalt film should look in density somewhat like this because at the if I consider this side substrate, this side air because we have seen generally that the density at the surface is less and after some point it goes to near bulk density. Similarly due to interpenetration or mixing between the surface, I mean between the substrate and the film there is a lowering of intensity at the interfaces. But here what I found by XRR is something very interesting. <coughs> 
what we found here actually, not just this structure, I will go back to the, we find a high density layer, high density layer, high density layer, density layer at two interfaces. One is at the substrate film interface, the other one at the substrate air interface. This is something not expected. And then XTM, we did XTM in this region and this is the region which I have highlighted here and the first Fourier transform of the XTM pattern over here gives me an FCC structure, FCC structure. This is also an interesting phenomena because this is high density, this is FCC, whereas cobalt is a ferromagnet which is HCP. Bulk cobalt is HCP, this cobalt is FCC at the interface and it has got an interface density almost one and a half times that of bulk density and FCC structure from XTM. So then we took this sample to a neutron reflectometer, it's at Oak Ridge. Now this will tell us this FCC cobalt, cobalt and its, its magnetism. So one is the physical density profile that I will obtain from nuclear scattering length density. In the same manner I obtained in XRR through electron scattering length density. So please see the neutron or polarized neutron reflectivity data. This is the physical density. It clearly shows the fits are here but the plus and minus polarized neutrons. This is the asymmetry parameter uh, over a very large Q range, almost up to 0.25 angstrom inverse. And you can see that the high density layer, so XRR and PNR, they are able to identify this high density layer and its density turns out to be similar to what we found from XRR values. So this is the physical density, now the magnetism. We have done, we have found out the magnetic density profile also from the reflectometry rate of X plus, um, R plus and R minus. This is the asymmetry parameter. Here, interestingly, the bulk of the cobalt has a positive scattering length density. That means it is ferromagnetic and that magnetic moment density profile shows that. But this high density layer, if I look at the high density layer at the two interfaces, they are non-magnetic. So these experiments, they allow us to identify a non-magnetic FCC cobalt layer at the interface. This has been reported here. So FCC and non-magnetic cobalt layer is an interesting observation because it is known that under high pressure cobalt goes to non-magnetic high density phase. But here in this uh, thin film at ambient pressure they were I mean when it use the film for reflectometry experiment, they are at ambient pressure. This same phase is obtained. So at the interface, we conjectured that due to grain boundary migration, grains, some grains got pressurized and they turned into this FCC high density cobalt in this specific film, which otherwise not seen in bulk at ambient pressure. So this is one very interesting result using magnetic moment density from thin films. Another interesting thing is coupling between a superconductor and a ferromagnet. This is an ideal <coughs> sample for polarized neutron reflectometry. Reason being, we know that superconductors are ideal diamagnets. 
if you remember superconductors conductors are ideal diamagnets that means they repel any magnetic field and generally you are familiar with this picture if there is a superconducting material with a mag in a magnetic field when you go at t less than superconducting transition temperature it will for a type 1 superconductor it will repel out the magnetic flux that's why a superconductor is known as a ideal diamagnet and in measuring magnetic moment density we should be able to identify <coughs> here the magnetism in a superconductor but now here we have gone into little more interesting aspect what we have here in this experiment that I am explaining to you we have got a trilayer so we have got YBCO formula given here it's familiar to you this is an insulator SRTIO3 STO and this is a ferromagnet LSMO lanthanum strontium MnO3 now this is a tunneling geometry that means if I show you then you will be familiar with this I hope you are familiar with tunneling so I have got a superconductor I have got an insulator and then I have got a ferromagnet so we have a superconductor and a ferromagnet separated by a layer of insulating STO STO that's a tunneling geometry now we are familiar with the fact that in case of superconductors we have tunneling of Cooper pairs of Cooper pairs pairs now what are Cooper pairs in BCS theory we know that electrons with opposite spin on the Fermi surface this is the Fermi surface they couple with each other so we have got a spin 0 Cooper pair and it is known that if I have a superconductor another superconductor with an insulator in between we can have two kinds of tunneling one is single particle tunneling known as Gaber tunneling we also have a Cooper pair tunneling where it might go from here to here and based on this many experiments and many devices like squid are built so in this case <coughs> we have uh, built a uh, trilayer where we have this tunnel we have invoked this tunneling geometry there are laser beam deposited and there are oxide so high tc superconductor then uh, insulator and then a ferromagnet uh, this superconductor has a superconducting transition temperature of around 65 kelvin we determine it from bulk measurements and also it has got Curie temperature of around 290 Kelvin that has also been obtained by bulk measurements interestingly in this case what we found from extra diffraction this is an extra diffraction pattern that nice layered structures do form XTEM tells us but this is a highly 00L oriented structure 00L oriented structure that you can see from the peaks that we obtain we call it YSL, YSL trilayer. You can see 0, 0, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You get so many of the orders of Bragg peaks in 0, 0, L index. Same for YSL and Y. If we make films of uh, YBCO and LSMO and YBCO, STO and LSMO, 
we get similar peaks. So, because of the what should I say, crystalline matching between these layers, we get a highly oriented films. There is a reason for me telling you this because this superconductor YBCO is a D wave superconductor. <coughs> superconductor. So, as I told you earlier, I mentioned to you that uh, other conventional superconductors are S equal to 0 and it has got a spherical symmetry of the Cooper pair. But here, because the D wave superconductor, D wave superconductor, there the band gap, the, there is a gap, superconducting gap at the surface of the, at the Fermi surface position, this gap is anisotropic, anisotropic and this is S equal to 0 and P is the wave function, the Cooper pair wave function. So, you can have d x square minus y square and that looks like this and d x y will uh, x y will x and x z will look lobes like with lobes like this. So the symmetry of the wave function for the Cooper pair is not spherical here it is like this and directionality in the deposited film should have something to say about the Cooper pair tunneling and also the gap that you see in various directions. Now let me get into the experiment of polarized neutron reflectometry. So, it is a highly oriented yttrium, barium, copper oxide, SRTiO3, LSMO film in which we have created a tunneling junction and we want to see how the magnetization is affected by the superconducting transition temperature.